Welcome back. This is Keith Parsons with the Heavy Wireless Podcast, and this is another episode of the Packet Pushers Podcast Network. And today I have with me Klaus Hedding of the Wi-Fi Now organization. Klaus, how are you doing? Great. Uh, thank you so much for having me, Keith. It's great to see you. Well, I brought you on to talk about two things. First up would be your conference, the Wi-Fi Now conference, and the second is your Wi-Fi Now manifesto. So tell me a little bit of the history of your conference. I think we started back in 2015, but this is actually the second conference. It might even be the third conference series that I'm doing on Wi-Fi. Way back, I did a series that was called the Wi-Fi Offload Summit. At the time, this was a super hot topic. That evolved in something called the Wi-Fi Innovation Summit, where we kind of broadened the scope. And then since 2015, we've been doing a Wi-Fi Now events, and that's today called the Wi-Fi World Congress. So it's kind of evolved over you know the last seven, eight years. I see it as a business-to-business event. It's very much, of course, focused on all the great things that are happening in the Wi-Fi industry, but we tend to be a little bit more business-oriented. When people ask me, I always present two buzzwords. One is innovation. So that's tied to, you know, the technical aspects, if you will, and new standards and new spectrum and what you can do with it, all of that. And the other is opportunity. I'm very entrepreneurial myself. I believe in opportunities within this industry. And in general, I believe very much in entrepreneurship. So we try to bring those two things together to the event, those two aspects of the Wi-Fi industry to the event. So innovation and opportunity. And we tried to feed people with ideas basically, and essentially uh, inspire people to do more with the technology to develop new use cases, to hear what other people are doing, to build their businesses, essentially. That was always kind of my guiding light for these events. Is that what I want? That's exactly what I wanted to do. And, and I have to say that that spirit has followed us all through this event series and continues to follow us. Depending on where we are in terms of new standards and things like that with Wi-Fi, they become a little bit more or less technical. But uh, this idea that you can drive your business forward by connecting with other people on these topics, I think is my fundamental idea and what I've been pursuing for these years. Well, one of the things I've noticed about your conferences is you have some really big high hitters who come and speak. How do you get a hold of the chairman of the FCC kind of presenters or the owners at Broadcom or Intel or the chip owners? I have to say it took a while. Initially, I had difficulty getting the Wi-Fi Alliance also. And in general, people didn't know what this was about. But over the years, they have obviously experienced that we have a great story to share, a really strong Wi-Fi story to share that's very much similar to their story. And of course, we incorporate their vision for what the Wi-Fi industry is all about into our programs and the way they communicate and so on. It's super interesting. Interesting because I think ultimately the reason why people come is because I've always been very, very passionate about advocacy for Wi-Fi in general, for the category, if you will, right? There's even a funny story. I eventually managed to get Ajit Pai to speak at one of my events. As far as I remember, it was in Washington, D.C. In Virginia, yeah. In Virginia, yeah. I was that there. Oh, exactly, in 2019. And I actually was following the 6 gigahertz and other things that that were going on. I think this might have been just before that, that were going on very closely. And I was fascinated by the work of the FCC. And I thought I was going to Washington, D.C. I said, okay, I'm going to write Ajit Pai and see what happens. And he's probably one of the kindest people I've ever met and most hospitable. He wrote me back within 30 minutes and said, hey, Klaus, I was wondering when you're going to ask. Of course, you're welcome to come visit. And apparently he had, you know, followed all the advocacy I had been doing together with lots of other people as well, of course, on New Spectrum. And he was at the time, of course, probably still is, I guess, a huge believer in setting the airwaves free. So I was amazed and I was stunned. And on my next trip to D.C., I got to meet Chairman Pai and uh, got a great relationship to him. And he spoke at my event and all of that. But I think the reason why this came about is simply because of the very, very strong advocacy. And I think that folks, even at that level, because I think my communications are very clear. Okay, this guy gets it, right? He gets what it is that we're trying to do. And and it's the same with huge companies like Qualcomm, Intel, so, you know, that kind of size company and of which many are involved is that they sense that I get it, what they're trying to do. And I'm very supportive of what they're trying to do. I think there's a spirit. And of course, these things are very commercial. They're big corporations. They make lots of money. But there's a certain spirit I've always identified with as far as Wi-Fi is concerned. And I think it has to do with this idea that anybody, in a sense, can do it. You can buy a $6 chip and start working on it if that's what you want to do. It's not, as a starting point, a billion-dollar licensed operation that you'll never get near. 
in your entire life. Sounds like you're talking a little bit from your cellular background. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. So, <laughs> so I have a cellular background. I worked for years and years with Nokia and bless Nokia. I, I learned so much. I was there, I guess, for eight or nine years. And I learned a tremendous amount from that. And those were, you know, during the glory days of mobile, right? And it was a fantastic experience and so on. But I also find that there are certain things that are somewhat limiting in, in the mobile industry that I didn't particularly like. I think there's not as much creativity. There's not as, not as much freedom. There's very hierarchical and so on. And I think the Wi-Fi is kind of the polar opposite of that, right? I think it's because the constraints of license spectrum you can't play unless you have those no. billions of dollars. That's it. And with unlicensed Spectrum, like you said, you can get in with just something little. That is something very, very special. I think it has become a source of freedom, right? I think for folks that want to create businesses in wireless, that they can do that. Freedom and opportunity, right? And I just think that is one of the best things that you can work for in life. One of the things, in addition to your conference, you also have a newsletter, but you have news about yes. current things going on all the time. Yes. And one of those, it was a couple of years ago, I think you had quoted, I think the Wi-Fi Alliance on how Wi-Fi has changed the GDP of countries. Yes. That's not a little thing anymore when you can actually point to a percentage of the GDP. There's a number of studies like that, and you know you have to look at them critically and so on. But there's no question about it that Wi-Fi is the workhorse of the digital economy. I mean, it's not a term that I invented, but I, I really do see it like that. And there's a lot of countries where you will not have any chance to connect to anything else because of you know the socioeconomic situation in emerging markets and so on. So there's no question about it that Wi-Fi has had a huge socioeconomic impact on countries all over the world, whether they be rich or or poor for that matter. You know, if you talk to some of these folks that were involved from the very beginning, like, for example, Vic Hayes, who was the first 802.11 workgroup chairman, when I asked him, what do you like most about Wi-Fi? And he's an elderly gentleman now. I met him a few years ago. He said, I want to show you this, he said. And he showed me a story from, I think it was from Nepal, where they were using Wi-Fi signals, essentially, to connect mountaintops and schools that had never been connected to the internet ever. There were folks there that had no idea what that was. And to him, that sort of humanitarian aspect of it was what he found most joy in after, you know, having accomplished a lot, of course, also in a lot of other places. So it has that aspect to it as well, right? It's really quite universal to think the benefit that the Wi-Fi industry has spread around, not just to big corporations, right? And of course, there's a lot of big business in Wi-Fi, but all the way to, you know, a mountaintop in Nepal where, you know, for a few dollars, you can somehow share a signal and, you know, get connected to the internet. I mean, this is the scope of it, right? It's quite remarkable when you think about it. And we're lucky we get to play in this community. Absolutely. And just using the word community, one of the things you came up with years ago, I think over a decade ago now, was your Wi-Fi Now manifesto. And one of the things you mentioned there is communities are important. I think the Wi-Fi has this weird community feel that doesn't exist in the switch or the router world. No. It's interesting, right? It has a certain spirit to it. And uh, you experience that as well, of course, and we do as well. I think it has to do with this grassroots type feel that Wi-Fi to a wide extent still has. I think it probably has to do with its roots as well. I mean, IEEE 802.11 is a super democratic standardization organization that collects a lot of super brainy but not necessarily very commercially minded people but people that really want to change things and do good things even at the grassroots level so I, I think it has that spirit to it I don't know how else to define it no question about that aspect of the community that there are people that you know have been incredibly loyal to wi-fi technology for their entire lives for, for whatever reason and they're amazing many of these people right you know them as well and I know them and it's like you know, they could do a million other things, but they just like doing this stuff, right? It's cool tech. I was sitting earlier today in Shrikant's session on Wi-Fi 6, Wi-Fi 7. Yes. And talking about 6 gigahertz, I think we can refer back to your first meetings with Chairman Pai. The U.S. kind of led the world on that, that 1,200 megahertz of 6 gigahertz. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. How, how is that affecting the rest of the world? It's starting to. I mean, I think there's a whole bunch of companies that jumped on the bandwagon fairly quickly. By the way, we're in Canada, and Canada's AFC beat USA. Uh, that's right. Canada's ahead. <laughs> and by the way, as far as I remember, Canada even has a little bit more spectrum than the U.S. altogether. And I don't know exactly why that is, but I seem to remember that. So Canada beat the FCC or the U.S. <laughs> About the whole 1,200 megahertz thing. Let me just start with it. Can you imagine if the 5G people had been given 1,200 megahertz? They would be screaming from the rooftops, right? One, they would never be given no. anything. I think that's part of the issue that we have to deal with. The leadership that, not just Chairman Pai, but there was a ton of people, a ton of groups that worked to lobby to get the six gigahertz and unlicensed because of those GDP effects that we had, right. we had talked about previously. Yes. Because the alternative, and there are some countries now are in the midst of this, is yeah. the alternative is we sell it. And for a government who's having a budget shortfall, the chance to sell that and yes. get literally billions and billions of dollars, or maybe hundreds of billions yes. for 1,200 megahertz, yeah. it's a big yeah. temptation. It's a huge temptation. But here's the issue specifically with 6 gigahertz now that he mentioned it. This spectrum is not empty because it's being used by utilities and so forth and satellite, lots of incumbents. So here's the thing. You can't really use it unless you share. And I don't know that they would be able to sell anything to the 5G or 6G people on a sharing basis. This is a complicated topic, right? But off the top of my head, I don't think it's worth anything on that basis. Or at least it can be disputed. In general, about 1,200 gigahertz, I mean, sorry, megahertz, that, that new 6 gigahertz spectrum. When that happened, even when I first heard about it, I had to basically sit myself down and pinch my arm because I said, where did that come from? And if that happens, you know, that's going to be the biggest thing ever to happen in wireless period in human history. I still think it is. I think we have only just started understanding what it's about because, you know, there's a number of things still missing and so on that we still need to work on. Hello, podcast listener. If you've ever wondered why no one's talking about IPv6, we've got good news. IPv6 Buzz is a twice-monthly podcast dedicated to this essential and sometimes perplexing protocol. IPv6 Buzz will equip you with everything you need to know about planning, deploying, and operating a v6 network. Hosts Ed Horley, Tom Coffeen, and Scott Hogue literally wrote the books on IPv6 architecture, deployment, and security. They share their knowledge and speak with other experts on topics including unique local addressing, DHCP v6, SLAC, firewalling and IPv6, and much, much more. They also answer listener questions, so if you've got a burning IPv6 issue, you may be able to get it on a show. So plug into the future with IPv6 Buzz. Find it on packetpushers.net or listen wherever you get your podcasts. Even if we only had it for LPI, for low power yes. indoor, yes, it would still be huge. Huge. The AFC just opens it up to do additional things with Correct. standard power. Correct. And so here's the thing. I don't think there's any chance that indoor cellular is not going to basically go away. I, I just don't see how that indoor cellular is a thing when you have... 1,200 megahertz of free spectrum available. And you've got things like Wi-Fi calling. It's been around forever, right? And of course, the devil is in the detail. It still needs to be exploited, right? And we have to you know, do the right things to make use of it and all of that. But the implications of the big six gigahertz chunk is just crazy and it's a fantastic opportunity. So the other thing I want to say about six gigahertz is, of course, as you said, it's not the whole world. So on behalf of Europe, and I'm European, I'm enormously disappointed <laughs> about what they're doing. It's not that there's no six gigahertz. Of course, there is. Hey, 500 megahertz is fantastic. It's just... Yes. Not what could have been. It's not what could have been, and it's going to be... I do believe something's going to happen. I think they will catch up. There's going to be a digital divide. That's what's going to happen, at least in the short term, until they catch up on the regulation. But I do think it's going to be similar eventually. Well, and from the vendor standpoint, you can't hold off because of Europe. No, no, no. You, you, you still have to make it. So you're, you're making the investments in the hardware, and the new access points, the new clients, Apple just yes. came out with their new iPhone 15 with 6 gig built in. Correct. Only in the Pro model, though. Yes. Yeah, it's okay. But that's in line with their, I think it's the iPad Pro and the MacBook Pro are also yeah. 60. So apparently 6 gigahertz is in the Pro category for Apple. Not that I necessarily agree, but that's how they're doing it. Right? It's just going to take a while. We see charts, and you've, you've shown charts in your conferences from the Wi-Fi Alliance of mm -hmm. the growth of 6 gig and the growth of Wi-Fi 6. I don't think they're going to be as fast as some of those little hockey stick charts show. No. Part of the issue is it's a little bit more complicated now because we had a quick succession of standards, right? And I don't blame people for being a little bit confused as to what to do with 6E and 7. Actually, 6 and 6E are quite close, and now we're getting into 7, right? I mean, I'm fairly optimistic. If you look at the numbers of, for example, laptop PCs or PCs in general that have been released with Wi-Fi 6E in them, 
There's a lot of those. The number of phones is maybe a little bit, should have been more perhaps with 6E, but I think the phone people are probably want to go for 7. But 6E laptops are all over now. And I think that's a really good result as well. Another question, and the reason I bring this up is because I've seen your view of Wi-Fi, which is very egalitarian out there. Your audience does both home, small business, as well as enterprise. Yes, And I've kind of grown up in the enterprise side. Yes. Wi-Fi 7s, and not just Wi-Fi 7, I think every generation is led in that smaller Soho market. Traditionally, yeah, there's a certain cadence to it, right? And it tends to be home gadgetry first, right? And then it gets to the enterprise markets a little bit later. So what you're saying is that the small enterprise market tends to be one of the first as well. It's a leader. They're definitely pre certification. Yes. And I'm not sure what that is, to be honest with you. Do you have a a thought on that? I think the retailer market likes fancy big numbers on the outside of boxes. Yes. And it gives (laughs) them a reason, oh, I need to upgrade because, I mean, I have have neighbors, family members call, yeah, should I go to Wi-Fi 7? Why? Do you have any Wi-Fi 7 devices? I I don't know, but I saw the ad. (laughs) Oh, that's right. So I think they lead that way, not necessarily because of the devices needed. And I also think the carrier gateway market is much faster than the enterprise market. The enterprise market tends to be a little bit more conservative, would you agree? Carrier is in big carriers putting home, yeah, because they just need they just need something that works. Yes. But they also have to beat their competitors Correct. by having something Correct. slightly better. Yes. I think the only thing that maybe disappoints me a little bit is that there haven't been more carriers adopting Wi-Fi 6E. But I think what we'll see, there are some big ones in the US and some in Europe as well, but I would have liked to have seen more, especially in Europe, I think. But I think what we'll see now is lots of carriers jumping on the Wi-Fi 7 bandwagon, right? I think it's a chicken egg thing. If my phone and my iPad and my TV require it, I will demand it from my carrier. Until I get there, it's a nice to have. But then once I'm there, and so they're like, how soon do I have to deliver it? Because if I'm a laggard, then I'm in trouble. Yes. But if I'm ahead of the game, I'm spending money and I'm not getting revenue back. Right, right, right. And I usually say, if people ask me, what, what is this driven by? I think Wi-Fi is in large part driven by exceptionally good device technology, in my view. I mean, the stuff that comes out of companies like Intel and Qualcomm and Broadcom on the device side is really, really good. And that's what consumers want, right? They want really great connectivity for their devices. And I think that's one side of it. And the other thing I think that drives the Wi-Fi market a lot, especially in the past maybe four or five years, is fiber to the home, but I guess also to businesses. And once you've got a gigabit into the house, you're going to want a gigabit in your house or in your business. And that means you've got to think of what Wi-Fi you're going to set up. So those, I think, are big drivers in my mind. Do you think the moving to COVID and everyone having to work from home was any extra driver to move things oh, faster. Oh, no question about it. And, you know, as much as I absolutely hated that situation I, and I didn't want any of it, it has been golden days for many people that are working in Wi Fi on the residential side and for things like mesh, consumer mesh, and things like that. I mean, we've had, and for that matter, on the device side, I mean, in some cases, 100% growth. Uh, you know, some of these companies just raking in the bucks because everybody needed new mesh. <laughs> if my Zoom call didn't work and I have to have it, you get new stuff. It has just been a bonanza for some of these companies. And for obvious reasons, because people were at home and they needed better Wi-Fi and everybody was at home and everybody basically needed better Wi-Fi. The amazing thing though is that to me is you needed new Wi-Fi and so on, no question about that, but most of the networks actually held up pretty well, which is actually good. It means the engineering is pretty good, right? But so it's not like things actually did not break down, which is impressive to me. Well, I think we learned the word latency that we, yes. wasn't in the normal vocabulary. Yes, so latency. <laughs> Latency. It's so funny when you think of this, the whole latency thing, you will remember this, Keith, years ago during the height of the 5G hype cycle, right? Latency, latency, latency. And even at that time, you know, they were saying, we're going to have millisecond latency. And I was saying, try to measure your Wi-Fi. In many cases, you'll find, even at that time, that latency is actually really low. And we already kind of have that 5G. But for the 5G people, it was, you know, the big thing. So, no, of course it is important. It is really important. And we're also, obviously, as you know, uh, with Wi-Fi 7 and all that, uh, working very hard on getting latency down for these super fast interactive services. Not just, of course, Zoom that we all use, I guess, now, but, you know, futuristic stuff for XR and things like that, right? Well, I have one final question. Yes, sir. 
5G versus Wi-Fi. <laughs> when you see that comparison, yes. what's your first response? Well, it is apples against oranges, right? But the interesting thing is it's the same end result. You cannot tell on your phone whether you're accessing a web page or whatever you're doing, whether that's coming over the 5G network or, <laughs> or Wi-Fi network, right? You can sometimes tell from the speed. That actually, the speed is usually, if you compare the standards, Wi-Fi has, as far as I know, always been way ahead in terms of the peak speed. So it's not a, in many ways, not a useful discussion. The reason why it winds me up sometimes is because the first thing that the mobile industry people do when they invent a new standard, and we've seen this from the three, four, and five, and it'll probably come for six as well. It says, we're going to take over all the use cases that Wi-Fi has. Wi-Fi is going to go. It's going to be 5G everywhere. And that's the first thing that they do. They start talking. One of the first things they start talking about that. And of course, it never happens. And there's a loads and loads and loads of reasons for that. But here's what I really think is the only logical and reasonable thing is that everything indoors by default should be Wi-Fi. In many ways, it already is, right? And it doesn't matter whether you're at home or the office or public venue, or whatever you happen to be. All of that is really best handled with Wi-Fi because that's what Wi-Fi is designed for. And it's actually getting better and better for those purposes. And 5G doesn't do particularly well because it comes in from the outside. It's not really designed you know, to shoot through big concrete walls and all of that. So in fact, your 5G service or your wireless service should continue into the house. The 5G should stop at your door and then the rest of it should be Wi-Fi and it should all be automatic. I mean, this is my vision for it. And we had this kind of vision when we were talking about offload in the old days. It's more like sort of, a, sometimes people call it convergence, but it's really about the best thing in the environment that you're in, right? Well, and like people say, well, how come I don't get Wi-Fi while I'm driving? Well, that's not what it's used for. That's one of the few places where I think 5G is really a good idea. It's actually in your car, right? Yeah. So on the street, in your car, things like that, and of course outdoors. But most of us spend most of our times indoors, I guess. We probably shouldn't, but we do. And that's where all the Wi-Fi is. And these days, because it's getting better and better, you know, it really is the best technology and the best kind of connectivity that you can get, in my view, indoors. And, and that's how it should be, right? All right. One last line. Yes. I'll just take from your manifesto from yes. 2015 or whatever. You just want to read off your first line item. Yeah. Wi-Fi everywhere for everyone. So Wi-Fi is the connecting fabric of the internet economy. We think Wi-Fi should be available everywhere for everyone. That's our mission and goal. And that hasn't changed, by the way. And in 15 years, that's still the goal and that's still where we stand. Ah, depends, right? But I think at least for the next 10 years... We have a lot of spectrum to work with, and I think that's going to drive us towards this Wi-Fi everywhere, right? Thank you for your time, Klaus. You're so welcome. Uh, this is Keith Parsons with the Heavy Wireless Podcast, part of the Packet Pushers Podcast Network, and we will see you on the next episode. Thank you.